The beauty of Data, for me, was Data was a fictional creature. You know, I mean, he didn't actually exist. Nobody had a, a prerequisite on how you play an android. And that allowed me to do anything I wanted. Maybe the closer we get, the more it's going to be a difficult job to play an android. But for me, it was, it was really uh, wide open because there, there was no uh, blueprint for how you play it. Smooth as an android's bottom, eh, Data? I beg your pardon, sir? Insurrection, I think, uh, was there... Uh, I think they tried to make a lighter film. Having made First Contact right before it, they thought they'd come back with something a little more uh, accessible to uh, more people. I think there was comedy in all of it, frankly. Um, even in the serious moments, there was comedy. And I have to say, by the way, that when we acted on Star Trek, those of us who were actors on the show, the more serious the moment was, the more we laughed. I mean, we were in hysterics all the time. And certainly, the more serious Patrick got, the more we laughed, the more he, he laughed. I mean, we, we were laughing nonstop through the whole thing. And there's just something about playing these big, ridiculous moments of, you know, what's on the view screen, um, or people with prosthetics on their heads, you know, it's funny. His nose should pant and his lip should curl, his cheek should flame and his brow should furl, his bosom should heave and his heart should glow, and his fist be ever ready for a knockdown blow. We sang a little bit, but I was the only one who sang. Patrick and, and, and Dorn and I, all three of us sang in that. Uh, some Gilbert and Sullivan, which we had to learn. I always wanted to sing on the show. And, uh, and then I sang uh, Little Life Forms in Generations. Life forms, you tiny little life forms. You know what, the movie was really fun to work on. Uh, we were out in the valley, it was beautiful, it had rained uh, a lot. That was the year of the El Nino, and so the hills were green, beautiful. It looked like Ireland out in the valley. Again, Jonathan was directing, so we had a really good time. Donna Murphy is great we had a, so much fun you know being around her and um uh i knew murray i had done uh the seagull on broadway uh, not on broadway but at the public theater at the new york shakespeare festival years ago uh, before that with uh f murray abraham and chris walken and rosemary harris and really amazing production and here was murray i hadn't seen murray since then and he said yeah i was wondering whatever happened to you and because uh, clearly he'd never seen an episode of Star Trek. He'd been living in Rome or something. And I said, well, you know, we're very popular in Rome. You just don't know it. This entire mission has been one Federation blunder after another. You will return, my men, or this alliance will end with the destruction of your ship. If you look at the original series, they had Chris Plummer and Frank Langella and uh, Chris Lloyd and um, Lawrence Luck and Bill and uh, and we had, you know, and Malcolm's from the theater and uh, Alfrey's from the theater and James Cromwell's from the theater and um, and now uh, Tom Hardy is like really landing big in the theater in England. There's something about Star Trek that. Uh, this sort of bigger than life quality of it uh, and the playing of these uh, dramatic situations that are bigger than life that require kind of a theatricalness to them. Uh, I always said from the very beginning, it was like a cross between playing Shakespeare and flying around your house when you were a kid with a towel around your neck, you know? Um, and so it, it did always attract theater actors. Why would they duplicate this village except to deceive the Baku. Deceive us. To move you off this planet. You go to sleep one night in the village, wake up the next morning on this flying holodeck. All of the episodes had a big idea attached to them, and all of the, the films had a big idea attached to them. I mean, that was sort of uh, essence of Star Trek was to deal, grapple with a topic from the point of view of the 24th century um, that was actually, that we were dealing with in our lives every day in, in, the, 19, in the 19th, and, or rather the 20th and 21st centuries. 
I'm at heart just a big fan. And uh, when I came to Hollywood, uh, the, I mean, the people I have met and seen, was, well, I was going to start with this at the beginning, is I had this premise that um, really, you know, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, that idea, I think I'm only four from just about anybody who's ever been in show business. And, uh, and really, for me, I think almost... Almost entirely, I have uh, anyone I ever wanted to meet is dead, and uh, uh, I'm sure that's not true actually. But I did get to meet a lot of really interesting people who I was a fan of, and uh, and I got to be very good friends with a lot of people who were just amazing people, and that is the best part of the whole deal. Six Degrees of Separation. We should do the Six Degrees with a Star Trek Separation game. You know, we did an episode of Star Trek with Gene Simmons. That connects me to Olivier in, in two. Um, and then three would be everybody Olivier worked with, you know? So that's Noel Coward. That's, uh, you know, Gilgood and Richardson and everybody they worked with. So that's four. I have certain key people in my life that I can connect. You know, like Angelica Houston, I did a movie with Angelica Houston uh, called Material Girls with the Great uh, Duff Sisters. and. Um, Angelica is like, Angelica Houston to John Houston to Walter Houston, that connects me to everybody that ever lived, practically. I'm, I'm just here to amuse. I really am. I have no interest, really, in, in altering someone's perception of who they are or what the world is, uh, other than that they might understand that it's also funny. I mean, that's kind of what I'm interested in. <laughs> In the event of a water landing, I have been designed to serve as a flotation device. I am most grateful to have had the, the, this great part to play and um, been part of this amazing epic that is Star Trek. And um, way, way, way more ups than downs about it. Star Trek Nemesis. Star Trek 10 Nemesis. Nemesis. Yeah. I was doing a play in New York, 1776, and uh, the woman who played my wife in the in the play, Linda Eamon, who's a brilliant actress, uh, said a friend of hers was coming to see the show and wanted to meet me. And uh, I said, great, let's go out after the show. And um, that person turned out to be John Logan. And uh, John had been a huge fan of the series, and and uh, so we, we became friends, and we, you know, through time have remained really good friends. So uh, he said to me at one point, I would like nothing more than to write a Star Trek movie. Actually, what happened was we wrote a story together, just on spec. Uh, and uh, there was no guarantee there was going to be a movie at that point. But they were there was rumblings that they thought, maybe let's do one more with this cast. And. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think the studio really wanted to do another one with us, but I think Rick did. I think Rick's idea was, there's no point in doing another one right now unless you use these guys. They're the guys. And so uh, Sherry was running the studio at the time, and she agreed, and they you know, set about to do another one. And John and I wrote this story, and uh, we presented it to Rick, and Rick read it, and he didn't really like it. He thought it was, um, it wasn't that he didn't like it. He just thought it dealt with an alternative reality where we were playing two of, everybody was two, uh, was playing two different people. And he felt they'd done too much of that in, in the series that didn't really make sense and he didn't really understand alternative reality and let's don't do that. But he was really happy to have John come in uh, and give it another shot. And so the three of us sat around and came up with another story and um, we presented it uh, that we thought was pretty good, and then Patrick read it, and he didn't care for it. So we worked on it some more, and then the studio didn't like it. Uh, and then we worked on it some more, and then everybody liked it. So we, that's how we wound up with uh, Nemesis. About time, Mr. Data. My mission was a success, sir. I've located the source of the radiation. This entire ship is essentially a Thaleron generator. Its power relays lead to an activation matrix on the bridge. It's a weapon. It would appear so. Patrick's objection, I think, originally was that 
it, it was in the first draft of it, it was going to require him to play things he'd already played in, uh, particularly in generations that there was a, a kind of a somber quality about his character that he didn't really want to explore any more of, that he felt he'd done it already. Originally, I think in the first draft we did, Shinzon, the villain, was actually Patrick's son uh, that he had thought had died years before. But he didn't want to have to, to really play that because he had played that sort of already. And uh, uh, so, so we made him a clone. And everybody seemed to kind of enjoy that idea. I can see as well as you can. I can feel everything you feel. In fact, I feel exactly what you feel. Don't I, Jean-Luc? I wrote, I'll tell you what I wrote. I wrote, believe it or not, action beats. I mean, I kind of worked on the story with them, but uh, John would call me and say, uh, we've got them on the other ship, and uh, how do they get off? And uh, I said, they fly, they steal a little ship and fly it through the ship and fly out, you know. And uh, he was like, great idea, let's do that. That, unfortunately, had we had the budget that this last movie had, that would have been a phenomenal sequence because what he wrote was amazing. But we had, we didn't have big budgets. We had smaller budgets, so... Um, we had to make that happen in 10 seconds as opposed to the two or three minutes of this ship flying through the other ship. I was in the, in the idea of uh, the two ships coming together and, and one group jumping from, because I said, uh, I think my idea was sort of a Captain Blood thing, you know, where it was, uh, you know, how they used to crash into ships, and, and they do it now in Pirates of the Caribbean, and, and they swing onto one ship from the other ship. That was sort of what I wanted to see. But we were writing the story, and we got to a point where either Picard or Data had to had to sacrifice himself. And it made a lot more sense for Data to do it because his programming had always been about uh, serving humanity. And it seemed to me a really sensible journey he made from Pinocchio to giving his life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure why people didn't like that. To me, it made a lot of sense. And there was an opening because B4 at the end is programmed with Data's memories. And, you know, it, very easily we could see him again. Only now he is Data because he's uh, ex accessed all of Data's memories. Or Dr. Sung, who invented uh, Data and Lauren before, uh, he may have had an actual blood son that we could meet who was a scientist who created a brand new android who could be some kid who then does the next 20 movies, you know? Anything could happen. A Star Trek, you know. My brother was not human. The fact of the matter is, I'm too old to play the part. People always say, no, no, you're not too old. You can say you had an aging chip and all. But why, why, you know, why compromise everything just so you can keep doing it? It's like, you know, where when I was young and or ish and started doing it, um, it was okay to be childlike, but it, there was something kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it just didn't land as well to be childlike uh, when you're, you know, in your 90s. It just didn't feel right. To family. None of the other actors ever got to do it again either, you know. Um, it wasn't like he, I, I didn't die, <laughs> you know. And it is Star Trek, and it is, you know, we did 178 hours plus four films, so that's, you know, about 185 hours of, of a character 
I didn't feel cheated at the end of it, and uh, I, I don't think anyone else did. We, to a person, all still see each other. And I just did a play, and uh, Marina came, and Gates came, and Dorn came, and LeVar tried to come, and uh, Jonathan tried to come, but their schedules didn't allow it, and Patrick's in London, and he was like, oh, I can't believe I'm not gonna be in LA while you're doing it. Um, we see each other every Christmas. We eat lunch together all the time. We have dinner together. We talk on the phone. We're like, you know, really extended family. So it didn't really end uh, for us.